Hello, these are notes number two in our serology unit and today's notes will cover blood evidence. As a forensic scientist, if you go to a crime scene and you find something that you suspect might be blood, you have to be prepared to answer three questions. The first question is, is the substance even blood? Now, I know that might seem like it would be obvious, but oftentimes as blood dries, it can appear to be other things and other things can appear to be blood. Here is a mattress with a stain on it. We don't know what that stain is. It could be blood. It might not be. It might be related to the crime. It might not be. But the first question is, is it even blood? Assuming that the blood, that the stain is blood, the second question is, is it human blood? There are lots of other animals that have blood and there is a possibility that that blood at the crime scene could be from a different animal. Maybe a chicken, maybe a cow, maybe the person's a butcher, who knows? So that's question two. If it is human blood, then the third question is, how closely can we associate that blood at the crime scene to a particular individual? Can we, quote unquote, match it? And there are several different tests we can do, uh, we can go through for that, which we'll get into both today's notes along with some of the other notes in the future. So those, that's the focus of these notes, trying to answer these three questions, assuming we find a stain or a substance at a crime scene, is it blood? Is it human? And can we match it to a person? Let's start with question number one. Is it blood? Thankfully for us, we have tests that will tell us whether or not something is blood or not. We call those tests presumptive tests because we presume that it is blood. I'm going to go through a few of them to explain how they work and when you might use them. The most common test is actually very simple. It's called a phenolphthalein test. You simply swab the stain with a Q-tip and then you put a couple drops of phenolphthalein on it. This chemical might sound familiar to you because we used it in chemistry classes. Uh, it is an indicator for bases. In the presence of a base, it turns kind of a purplish pink. And because almost everything in nature that is red is acidic, so tomatoes, bell peppers, all these things are, are acidic. Blood is basic. So if our red sample turns basic, we actually presume that it's then blood. The second presumptive test is called luminol. This we spray on to large areas to look for blood that's maybe not uh, readily seen. It binds with the hemoglobin that's in the blood and then fluoresces under a UV light. Uh, this, those two are the most common tests to see if something is blood. Is it possible that something could give a positive test on one of these and not be blood? It is, but that's rare and those things generally aren't things that we would be confusing for blood at a crime scene. Uh, there are several others. Oh, here's a picture of some luminol. Here's a a carpet that was presumably cleaned and you can't tell there's blood there to the naked eye, but when you spray the luminol and then hit it with a UV light, it does fluoresce blue. Uh, some of the other presumptive tests that have been used in the past or are still used under circumstances, uh, there's one called the fluorescein reagent. There's another called the Castle-Meyer color test that was used for quite uh, many, 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 many years. Um, there's a test called the orthotolidine test and the hematistic strip test. The hematistic strip is very uh, situational. It's for finding blood in a urine sample, which who knows, maybe we have a urine sample and we need to see if there's blood in it. So test one, do a presumptive test. If we get a positive result from the presumptive test, we can assume it is blood. And the second step is then to determine if it's human blood. Now, in order to understand how we tell if a particular blood at a crime scene is human, I need you to know 
a little bit about how our immune system works in order to understand how we make a test that can tell if blood is human. So we're going to stop. I'm going to have you watch the brain pop video, good old Tim and Moby from middle school, on your immune system so you can understand how antibodies work and what they do. And if you already know that, you're welcome to fast forward through that. But it is a good refresher for those of you who know or a good way to learn what an antibody is and how it works in your body. So we're going to take a second and watch that right here. Yes. Oh. oh, sorry. Dear Tim and Moby, why do we get sick from Ashley? Yeah, I was just asking myself the same question. <coughs> Cut it out. No one likes to have a fever or a cough that just won't stop. But you get sick a lot more if it weren't for your immune system. That's a system of tissues, cells, and organs that help your body fight off illness and disease. Your immune system starts with some general defenses against pathogens. Those are any germs or chemicals that can make you sick. Skin is like a shield that prevents pathogens from entering your body. Mucus in your nose traps many of the pathogens you inhale, preventing them from getting into your bloodstream. And stomach acids kill bacteria that live on the food you eat. Sometimes, though, germs get by those defenses and into your blood. White blood cells, or leukocytes, patrol your bloodstream looking for these invaders. If leukocytes recognize a germ, they'll kill it before you get sick. Your immune system sends lots of germs running for their lives on a daily basis. But if it doesn't recognize them, the germs could multiply, invade your cells, and make you sick. But your immune system is always learning. When they figure out what's making you sick, white blood cells create antibodies to fight the infection. An antibody is a protein that binds with a molecule or antigen found only on the invading germ. The antibody is sort of a red flag signaling leukocytes to kill the germ. Some antibodies can neutralize germs on their own. If you get sick from a virus, like the flu or a cold, your immune system can usually fight it off on its own. But bacterial infections, like strep throat, may require assistance from antibiotic medications. Oh, and the coolest thing about your immune system is that it remembers. When you have something like the chicken pox, your body memorizes the antibodies it built to fight it off. If that chicken pox pathogen tries to enter your body again, the immune system will know how to get rid of it. That's how vaccines like polio and measles shots work. Your body is injected with a tiny amount of virus. Usually, the virus is either killed or deactivated, but your immune system still recognizes it and creates antibodies for it. So if those diseases ever come your way, they won't make it far. Once you have the antibodies for a certain illness, you're immune to it. Well, actually, your immune system does need your help. Simple things like not getting enough sleep or not eating right can weaken your immune system so that you get sick more often. And sometimes, pathogens attack the immune system itself. You've probably heard of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. HIV attacks white blood cells and weakens your immune system to the point that your body can't fight off pathogens. When this happens, something like a simple cold can make a person really sick. Nope, HIV isn't the only cause of immune system malfunctions. People's immune systems can also break down as a result of things like malnutrition, obesity, and drug abuse. And sometimes, the immune system goes haywire from something called autoimmunity. That's a condition when the body's immune system overreacts to certain cells in the body that are not really a threat. When that happens, a person's own immune system essentially attacks him or herself which is really bad news. <clears throat> well, the common 
cold is actually lots of different viruses that produce similar symptoms. Just because your immune system fought off one cold virus doesn't mean it'll be ready for the next one. Uh, I, I can't drink all that. Okay, okay. Okay, now that we all have a good idea of how your immune system works and what an antibody is and what it does, let me explain how we see if the blood we find at a crime scene belongs to a human. And as far as the forensic scientist is concerned, the test is very simple, takes very, very little time. But in order for you to understand how it works, I need to go backwards in time a little bit to explain how the test is made. So. I'm going to explain the, the process by which the test is made so you can understand how it works and then what the forensic scientist actually does with it at the crime scene. The test is called a precipitin test or gel diffusion test. The only difference is whether you have a lot of blood sample or a little. If you have a lot of blood sample, it's called a precipitin test. If it's a small sample, it's a gel diffusion test. It's just whether you're doing it in a test tube with the precipitin test or on a little gel plate for the gel diffusion. But it's the same test done the same way. Here's how it works. We're going to focus first on this left hand side on the before. Basically in a lab they will take a rabbit and they will inject that rabbit with human blood. Now rabbits shouldn't have human blood in it. So to a rabbit that human blood is an invader just like a disease. They then will wait for about two weeks for that rabbit to have an immune response to the human blood. So that rabbit's body, its immune system, is actually making antibodies specifically to fight off human blood. After about two weeks, the lab then takes out some of the rabbit blood and filters out those antibodies that the rabbit made that are anti-human antibodies. At a crime scene, if a, if a forensic scientist finds a stain which they use a presumptive test on and they determine it is blood, they then will mix some of that blood from the crime scene with some of that anti-human antibodies that they bought from the lab and they'll mix it together. Now if it is human blood, the antibodies will stick to the blood and we will get what's called agglutination. Let me show you what agglutination is. Agglutination is just the clumping of particles. So here are the antibodies that were made by the rabbit's immune system and it will attach to the red blood cells and they will clump together and stick together. So if we get this agglutination we know that that blood is human blood. If we don't get agglutination that means those blood cells that were in our sample aren't human because they don't have the specific receptors on them that the rabbit's immune system made antibodies for. So as far as the forensic scientist is concerned, the test is very simple. Take a little sample of the blood from the crime scene, add some of the anti-human antibodies, mix it up and see if it clumps together. And if it does, then it's human blood. And if it doesn't, it's not. But to understand how it works, we do need to know how the immune system works. So now we've answered the question of is it blood? And if it is blood, is it human blood? So the third question is, can we match that blood to a particular individual? And what you might be thinking is, let's test their DNA. Well, we're jumping the gun. We don't go and just test DNA of blood against an individual because it takes time and it's costly. It's exactly like checking to see if the minutia on a fingerprint matches before we check to see if the general pattern is the same. Because if one person has loops and the other person has, and the crime scene is whirls, why would we even check minutia? Same thing here. There's a first step, a very quick, cheap, inexpensive step that we can do to see if the blood probably or possibly matches before we ever jump to DNA. And that's what we're going to cover today. 
It is called the ABO blood typing test. In order to see if the blood at a crime scene matches a particular individual, step one, test one, is to see if it's the same blood type. Let me take you through this. We'll try and go as quickly as we can and then have a cool activity for you to do on another assignment so you can kind of test this out and see how it works. Blood typing was uh, discovered in 1901. Carl Landsteiner developed this system of the ABO system as a way to classify blood and it's all based on some proteins, which he called antigens, on the surface of the erythrocytes. So it's all about the red blood cell. Now, throughout history, there have been a lot of crazy things people have done with, um, for quote unquote medicine. At one point, they believed that if you were sick, the best thing to do was to get blood out of you because the blood must be uh, poisoned or tainted. It was called bloodletting. They literally would cut your veins open and let the blood drain out to get rid of the bad infection. George Washington actually died from bloodletting. At some point they realized, yes, there might be something wrong with the blood, but taking the blood out is killing the person. So let's just put new good blood in. The problem is, when they did these early transfusions, they didn't realize there were different blood types. And if you get a transfusion of a blood that's not the same type as yours, then your body sees that blood as an invader and your immune system will attack it and destroy it. And when you destroy all those blood cells, it releases a toxin which will potentially kill you. So a lot of people were dying from tra uh, transfusions. And it wasn't until Carl Landsteiner figured out that there are these different uh, types of blood, different little proteins on the red blood cells, which make our blood different, that we are able to start doing transfusions more successfully. Let me show you the differences between the different blood types. There is a type of protein which he named antigen A, which you might have on your red blood cells. If you do, then we say you have type A blood. And in the United States, about 42% of the population has type A blood. There's a second protein that could be on your red blood cell, and he named that antigen B. If you have that antigen B protein on your red blood cell, then we say you have type B blood, and only about 10% of the United States population has that. You might have both proteins on your red blood cell, both antigen A and B, in which case we say you have type AB blood. That is only about 4% of the United States population, so the most rare. Or your red blood cells might not have any of these proteins, in which case you are type O blood, and O is for zero. And that actually is the most common thing, and it's about 44% of the population. So let me walk you through how that would look like. Here is a typical red blood cell that has the A antigen on the surface. Here's a type B blood with the B antigen. You can see it's a different protein than the group A. Here's somebody who has both, so they're A B blood. And here's somebody whose red blood cell has neither. Now, if you have type A blood, your body will make the antibody against the B protein. If you have type B blood, your body will make the antibody against the A protein. If you are lucky enough to have both the A and the B on your red blood cells, then your body won't make any antibodies. But if you have the type O blood, meaning your red blood cells don't have any of those extra proteins, then your body will make antibodies against both. So if I have type A blood, I cannot get a transfusion from somebody with type B. If I have type B blood, I cannot get a transfusion from type A. If I have A, B blood, I can get a transfusion from anybody with A or B or AB or O. In fact, type O blood can be given to anybody because it doesn't have any proteins that might make an immune response. But if you have type O blood yourself, 
then your body will react against A blood, against B blood, and against AB blood, and you can only get a transfusion from other type O blood people. Now this worked really well for a, quite a while, but every once in a while, somebody would still die. And Carl Landsteiner was still doing more research and he found 39 years later that there is yet another very, very, very small protein that he missed and everybody else missed too. And he named it the rhesus factor or RH. And he found that you either had it or you didn't. If you had the RH factor, another protein on the red blood cell, he said you were RH positive. And if you didn't, you were RH negative. Now in terms of statistics, most people are positive. About 85% are RH positive. So let me show you how this now complicates the blood typing situation. Here is our red blood cell with type A. And this little blue thing is going to represent our RH factor. So if you have the A antigen and the RH factor, you're A positive. Again, you will still make antibodies against type B. If you are A but you don't have the RH, you're A negative, and your body will make antibodies against type B and against RH. So this person can get a transfusion from other type A blood, or, and it doesn't matter if it's A positive or A negative, but this person who's A negative cannot get blood from an A positive person because their body will make this antibody and destroy that blood and potentially die. B positive has the B antigen and the RH. B negative has just the B. AB positive, these lucky people, have all three of the proteins, which means they can take blood from everybody because their body is used to the A protein, the B protein, and the RH factor. Let's go down to the O's. There are people who are O negative. Their red blood cells have no proteins, which means their blood can be given to everybody. They're called the universal donor because their blood is quote unquote clean and it will not make an immune response from anybody. But their body will make antibodies against A, B, and RH. So if you want a transfusion as an O negative person, you can only take O negative blood. It is the uh, most difficult blood to get for these people and they're constantly having shortages. If you are O negative, it would be really great if you donated blood because they need your blood. All right, we're almost done. I want to take one little quick tangent because it is um, a point of interest, I think, although it doesn't have anything to do with uh, criminal investigations. And that is that it is possible for the mom to have an RH negative blood and the baby have RH positive blood because the father, the baby daddy, had RH positive blood. And that gets into a situation called hemolytic disease. The mom, if they're RH negative, remember that's only about 15% of the population. If they then have a positive blood baby, then usually the first pregnancy goes fine. But in any subsequent pregnancy, the body produces antibodies against the RH positive and the body will reject the fetus. So back in the olden days, they used to make people, uh, make couples take a blood test before they got a marriage license because they wanted to see that their uh, blood was compatible. And if the female was negative and the male was positive, they would counsel them to say, hey, you're probably only going to be able to have one baby at most. Nowadays, they actually have drugs so that they're able to uh, reduce the mom's immune system to the point where she can have more than one baby. But if you do have RH negative blood as a female, you do have to be aware of this interaction with um, having a baby that's RH positive. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about, and then we're done. Um, 
For serology, this unit and these notes we've been covering and just talking about bloods, but the reality is serology actually does cover all body fluids, not just bloods. And this does come into play when we're talking about blood typing. And that is that for most people, you can find the blood type from their saliva, their semen, even teardrops. That is because that protein that's on those red blood cells also gets secreted in other body fluids. We call those people um, secretors, and we found that about 15 to 20 percent are non-secretors. That means you can't determine their blood type from other body fluids, but the vast majority of people are secretors, and so you can actually tell their blood type from other samples, not just blood. So hopefully we get the idea from these notes that if you find a stain at a crime scene, we do have these three steps we go through. Is it blood? If it's blood, is it human? And if it's human, can we take the first step to see if we can match that blood to a person? And that first step is testing their blood type to see if their blood types match. In future notes, we will go over how we then, if their blood types match, how do we do DNA testing? We'll also be covering some other things in terms of how blood acts at a crime scene, blood spatter, and that kind of thing. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.